Good morning. Glad you're here. Some people would refer to the next thing I'm going to talk about as housekeeping, but it's actually far more significant than that. Uh, next Sunday, our church family will select uh, the person who will sit on our church council for a three-year term. And uh, the way that's done in lots of places and lots of times is whoever is the most popular or knows the most people just kind of gets in. Or who has the most friends that are willing to, to uh, connect with others. Um, if you were to ask me five reasons why I think our church has seen fruitful growth, one of those reasons would be the people that God has brought to the council table to help oversee our finances and our ministries. And so we always approach this not as a political maneuver or a popularity contest, but as a prayerful moment. And our goal is just to simply to take the two individuals whose uh, names are presented to us and to pray and then cast our ballot. So if you are a member and you are here next Sunday, you will have the opportunity to do that. The two people whose names are, are standing are Emmanuel Bradley and Alphonse Sasso. And so I would covet your prayers uh, for those individuals and that God will bring the right person to the right place at the right time for the right reasons. Amen? Good. Um, I'm setting my timer. Somebody wants to know what that means. Sometimes nothing at all. Okay. Uh, we're in the 20th week, believe it or not, of going through the Gospel of Matthew. And today we're going to deal with one of the most terrifying passages in all of Scripture. This is the passage that keeps some people awake at night and makes them most afraid about their relationship with God. And so what I'm hoping today is to tackle this in a way that helps us understand it better, but even more importantly, understand God better in the process. So in Matthew chapter 12, it starts by saying, then they, being some people, brought Jesus, a demon-possessed man, who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? So we start out with this uh, reality is that Jesus takes the spiritual realm as seriously as he takes the physical realm. And this is odd to the modern mind because we really have come to believe that basically every effect has a scientific cause and that the evidence that something is real is our capacity to see it with our eyes, to touch it with our hands, that, that our senses are actually what reveal what is real. And there are things that are invisible to us, but that does not mean they are not real. Our tendency in spirituality is to move one way or the other on this. Some of us move more towards the physical, and so we'll focus on maybe physical appearance, we'll focus on physical actions, we'll focus on physical deeds. And there are other people who may gravitate more to the spiritual, so they'll focus more on reflection, meditation, those kinds of things. And Jesus just simply refuses to choose sides on this. He thinks the physical is important. He brings healing. He thinks the spiritual is important. And he brings freedom. And this is a, a fascinating uh, passage. And I know that to the modern mind, this feels superstitious. Like, well, of course, in, in the ancient world, everything they didn't understand, they just laid the blame to some kind of invisible, uh, malevolent spirit that caused this. But Jesus is not being superstitious. There's no fear in him, nor does he inspire fear in others. What he's recognized is that there are symptoms that this man is experiencing for which there does not seem to be a genetic cause, an injury cause, or a human pathology cause. There's something else going on. He's unable to see and he's unable to speak. But there is no scientific reason for his condition. So Jesus knows that there could be a spiritual reason. And he discerns the cause. And what's fascinating, this is really interesting, because we do have other stories of Jesus exercising evil spirits. We see nothing of his methodology here. It's not recorded for us. Matthew just leaves it out. And the word he uses to describe what happens to the man is that he was healed. This is really interesting information. 
And so what he says is he was healed and he was able to both see and to speak. And the result is, is that people began to ask a question. And the question was, could this be the son of David? That's a messianic term. Could this be the person that had been foretold for hundreds and hundreds of years that would come and, and restore the kingdom of Israel to its glory, but also make things right in our world? And so... The thing is, is that there can be a positive and a negative way to ask that question. So here's what I want you to see. We should pay attention to questions that cause faith to contend with doubt. We should pay attention to questions that cause our faith to contend with our doubts. And so could this be the son of David? That can be a positive question and a negative question. Could this be the son of David? Positive. Is it possible? Negative. Could this be the son of David? And the question is, which one are they doing? And the answer is, in a crowd of people, you're likely to get both. And Jesus isn't offended by the question. He sees that this is actually evidence of the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That there are questions that begin to come to us. And it's so easy to assume that it's our intellect and our capacity and, and, and what we've read and who we've talked to that determines the kinds of questions that form in our mind. But Jesus also understood that sometimes the Holy Spirit is at work in a way that helps us form a question in our mind that if we take it seriously, it's amazing where it can lead us. So it goes on and it says, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul you probably have heard the name Beelzebub, uh, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. This is not what we would refer to as an encouraging word. Okay. Uh, why are they upset? A person has been healed, and now they can see and they can speak and and the Pharisees are upset. Well, they were upset when we left them last week. And that had to do with the Sabbath. They accused Jesus of not properly honoring the Sabbath. And his response was three, three responses from Scripture. Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? And now he's going to respond in quite a, a different way. But the point here is that the Pharisees were already offended. And here's what I want you to, to take away from this. The more we think we know, the more easily we're offended when someone doesn't agree with us. The more we think we know, the more easily offended we are when someone doesn't agree with us. They did not say they were opposed to exorcism. They did not say, that's not true, that doesn't exist, that doesn't work, that can't be. Their offense was with Jesus. And here's the challenge, is that when people are offended, you've probably noticed this in our world, right? In our world, someone can't just have a different point of view. They have to be demonized. It's very rare to hear people say anymore, well, I can see that point of view, but this is how I think. That's not the kinds of conversations that happen very much. And it reveals something. So going on, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man and then he can plunder the house? In the previous interaction with the Pharisees, Jesus responds with, it is written, it is written, it is written. In this response, he uses common sense. How many are glad that God can, can use common sense to help make a point, right? 
You did not have to check your brains at the door when you came in this morning. It's a rational response. And he, he challenges the idea that just because you don't agree with me does not mean that what's happening here is actually inspired by the demonic. And what he says is, if this person has found freedom as a result of the work of the Spirit, then it's evidence that God's kingdom is breaking in around you. What's interesting here is that Jesus declares that if he's acting with the authority of the Holy Spirit, this is really interesting, with the authority of the Holy Spirit, that God's kingdom is breaking in. We saw, Matthew's really interesting in how he lays things out. In Matthew chapter one, we see the work of the Spirit in conceiving the life of Christ. In chapter three, we see the work of the Holy Spirit empowering Jesus, not only to face temptation, but to do the work of ministry and fulfill his purpose in God's kingdom. In chapter 10, we actually see the work of the Holy Spirit giving people confidence when they are attacked to be able to defend the gospel, the good news. And here we see the work of the Spirit to bring freedom to someone who was bound. They were unable to see. They were unable to speak. Now, I actually, I, this could be offensive to some people, I actually believe that this story is a real story and a true story. I don't think that the purpose of stories in the Bible is to, to metaphorically examine them and say, well, it doesn't matter whether it really happened or not. What matters is whether we can see the truth behind it. I don't think we have to pick and choose there either. It's a real story, but there's also truth behind it. This story is selected for a reason. It's given to us on purpose because there was an individual who was unable to see and unable to speak. I wonder how many people there are in our world today that when it comes to seeing what might be possible or seeing a way out or seeing how things could ever work for them or seeing things in a way that is actually healthy, it feels as though they can't ever see it and it doesn't matter how much you talk to them, they can't ever see it. And there are some people who never seem to find their voice. They are unable to to ask for help, and they are unable to speak up for themselves or for someone else. They have a voice. They're just unable to use it. They have eyes, but they're unable to see with them. And what Jesus does is he comes in and he binds the strong man. He takes authority over the evil spirit, and the result is this person walks out, and now he could see things he couldn't see before and say things he couldn't ever say before. Now, somebody said, well, you're just saying if I'm shy that I'm, I have a demon. No, I am not. There are lots of things in our world that are not caused by demons. They're just caused by us. Okay? And some people do have a shy personality. Well, let's just check. How many people have a shy personality? Yeah. And the rest of you, you didn't raise your hand. Do you know why? Because you're shy. This isn't about, is your personality shy? It's a kind of thing where you're trapped. I just can't see anything possible, positive. I can't see any way out. I can't see how this is going to work. I can't see how this marriage is going to survive. I can't see how my kids are going to succeed in life. I can't see anything. And in that darkness, it's amazing how terrifying things can become. And we lose our voice. I don't think it's any accident that the first thing that happens when we're born is that our voice is heard in the world because it matters. Your voice matters. And he says, if by the Spirit of God I'm bringing freedom, healing like this, then the kingdom of God is breaking in around you. And the kingdom is actually a social word. It's, it's not a, a political word the way we think of it. And, and what, this is what he's saying. I, I love this. He's saying, if that person is finding freedom, it's not just that person finding freedom. The Holy Spirit is breaking into the community. What does that say? And, and here's the challenge. Often we hear that and what we think is, well, the Holy Spirit is breaking into our faith community. Hallelujah. God is doing things here at Calvary. We're so grateful for that. This is how Jesus interprets that. 
Not just God is doing something for an individual, and God is not just doing something for a community of faith. God is doing something for the greater Rochester area. It's evidence that the Spirit of God is breaking in. And not just in Rochester, but in New York, and not just in New York, but across the United States, and not just across our country, but across every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every nation, every continent, every people group. How many are glad God is at work in our world today, right now? That's what he's doing. So how many have also noticed not every need is met? Lots of us have, have needs that we probably have prayed for for a while. Some of you may have discovered a new one since you've been here. And so Jesus does not see a tension between the present kingdom and the future kingdom. The present kingdom shows that needs are being met right now, and the future kingdom shows that for the needs not yet met, there is coming a day when all the needs will be satisfied by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It gives us something to look forward to. Um, there's also a, a picture of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. If I, Jesus is the acting agent, am, have authority from the Holy Spirit to bring freedom, then the kingdom of God has come among you. The Son is the acting agent, which, which brings us to this point. Kingdom people do not act on their own authority or with their own agenda. If, if we're just trying to have our own authority, if we just want to have our own preferences imposed on others, that's really not the kingdom of God. We're trying to build another kingdom. And some people are really good kingdom builders. Like, they can do that. But if that's our goal, then that's, that's not evidence of God's kingdom breaking in. That's evidence of us building a kingdom. And those kingdoms are temporary at best. Then Jesus says this. The strong man is a reference to this evil power can be tied up, can be bound, obviously by someone who's stronger, right? And this is what he says. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm not sure quite how to, to think about this. But if the strong man is tied up, then his possessions can be carried off. I think a lot of times we think of, of demonic possession as though a spirit is, is influenced by evil spirits to do horrible things. And Jesus gives us a nuance here that I don't think we're very familiar with. And he said, this power, which is not neutral, it actually intends harm, has possessions. He considers people his possession. And when he is tied up, those possessions can be taken out of that influence. It's a really interesting concept. We always think of, well, possession would be doing a bad thing. Maybe if we are being owned by, controlled by something else, we're unable to do good things. Uh, Beginning in verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. Here we go. <laughs> this is the stuff that drives our culture right up a wall. If you are under 25 years old, this verse has already offended you. If you're over 25 years old, you're waiting to see if you should be offended. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you that every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. This is the terrifying verse. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. That sounds serious. Here's what I want us to think. Jesus actually said, every sin can be forgiven. And then he said, blaspheming the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Is that a contradiction? And it sounds like a contradiction to us. But when something sounds like a contradiction, it may be an opportunity to see something in a new way. And that's what I'm going to try to do this morning. Both Matthew and Luke quote Jesus saying this phrase this way. Mark actually has Jesus saying something different in a different story. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus says, 
anyone who is not against us is for us. So did Jesus change his mind or his position? Like, is he finally ticked off with the Pharisees and he's changed his mind? And the answer is no. The context of Mark chapter 9 is the disciples came to Jesus and they said, we saw a person and they were casting out demons and they were using your name, but they're not one of us, so we forbid him. And Jesus said, don't forbid him. Anyone who's not against us is for us. What's the difference? In this scenario, there is a person who's trying to do good things to help people find freedom. In this story, we have Pharisees who care less about people's freedom and more about their control. And so Jesus is speaking to two different situations, two different kinds of people groups. Jesus can discern the difference. So in Mark 9, whoever is not against me, Jesus is saying this, working for, they're working for the same things. And Mark, we want people to find freedom. <laughs> there are people who will try to do a similar thing, but they can't work with somebody else because they don't think just like them. I don't know anybody who thinks just like me, including myself five years ago. That's just true. In what ways can we bring freedom? And this is what Jesus comes to. He says, these Pharisees are acting to limit people's freedom, to make them afraid to access the resource that brings freedom. Jesus wasn't saying almost sin, almost every sin can be forgiven. Every sin can be forgiven, which brings us to another problem, and that is forgiveness is scandalous. Forgiveness is scandalous. What do I mean by that? There are sins that you can think of right now that you are likely to think should not be forgiven. Just by reason of the incredible, incredible, horrible damage that was done, the pain that was caused, the innocent lives that were ruined. And we are actually offended with God. How could you forgive them for that? because that feels like injustice to us. How could God forgive that? And we are offended. And Jesus sees things quite differently. Every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. That is incredible news. And it's frustrating news at the same time. Jesus says this. He says that speaking against the Holy Spirit is not forgiven in this age or the age to come. So is this a contradiction? Let's just check. How many would, would be willing to go out on a limb and say it feels, it, at least at first appearance, it seems like a contradiction? Yeah? Okay. We still have shy people in the house. Glad to, glad to see that. Um, Jesus understands something that we forget. And that is, it's not just information that changes a person. It's the work of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit that draws us towards God. It's the work of the Spirit that opens our hearts and opens our minds. It's the work of the Spirit that helps us realize we need forgiveness. It's the work of the Spirit that helps us receive forgiveness. And this is a very different way to think about this. It's not so much, you know, if you, if you say a bad thing about the Holy Spirit, that's it, you're done. It's more like this. The single resource that helps you experience 
first of all, your need for forgiveness and receive the grace of forgiveness is actually the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you cut yourself off from the work of the Holy Spirit, what access do you have to it? it it's it's kind of like this, right? So if, you, if there's medication that you take to keep you healthy, to manage some kind of disease state, if you stop taking that medication, you're not going to get better. In fact, you may get worse. That's not a judgment. You just stopped accessing the one thing that could help you. If you are hungry and you separate yourself from food, you will not be nourished. In fact, you do it long enough, you could actually starve. If you're thirsty and you separate yourself from water, you will not be hydrated. You will actually become dehydrated. That's not a judgment against you. It's just recognizing if I fail to access the thing that makes me healthy or, may, or nourishes me or hydrates me, that there are real consequences for that. And what he's saying is, is when you separate yourself from the work of the Holy Spirit, where do you think you're going to find forgiveness? Where are you going to find grace? Forgiveness and grace is not something we work up on our own merits, in our own strength, by our own intellect. That's not how it works at all. Forgiveness and grace are not things we achieve. They are gifts we receive from the Holy Spirit. We should always want whatever the work of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. If we cut ourselves off from the Holy Spirit, we're cutting ourselves off from the only resource that brings us to God, that convicts us of our sins, and that helps us know we are forgiven and that we actually belong to God. Now, our questions can be evidence of the Holy Spirit's work. I think a lot of times our, our tendency is to believe that I can prove the Holy Spirit is working in my life because I became convinced about something. Maybe the questions that are coming to your mind are evidence that the Holy Spirit is working. Could this be true? Could this be the Spirit of God? Could God be doing something in my life right now? That question could well be inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Jesus goes on and says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad, its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you say, how can you say, uh, you who are evil say anything good, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every word that they've spoken. By your words, you'll be acquitted. By your words, you'll be condemned. Jesus uses this concept a lot, that you can identify what a tree is by the fruit it produces not the other way around. If you're experiencing hope and, and freedom and healing and growth and community, that's good fruit. That's good. If you're experiencing shame, life controlling behaviors, stagnation, isolation, it's not good. And it really doesn't matter how much of a moral argument we can make in our mind. It's not good. Jesus is on the cross because people have said things about him that were not true. And he's being crucified and he's being mocked and beaten. And in that moment, what is his response? And it's amazing. You can say anything against the son. Listen to his words. Father, forgive them. Any sin can be forgiven. That is the most astonishing news. They don't understand what they're doing. Forgive them. Jesus wasn't offended 
by what was said about him because Jesus was confident in who he was in relationship to his father. So let's bow our heads this morning. Question, do you feel trapped? Do you not see a way out? Have you lost your voice to be able either to ask for help or to stand up and speak up for things that matter? And what Jesus wants you to know is that the healer is in the house today. And you don't have to stay in that condition any longer. He's come to give you your voice back. He's come to show you things that you cannot see on your own. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And you might be sitting there and wondering, could this even possibly be true? Maybe that question itself is the beginning of the work of His Holy Spirit. And it will make all the difference, all the difference in your life and in the lives of anyone who has anything to do with you. So Father, for those who feel trapped, for those who feel blinded to what could be possible that is good in their lives, for those who are unable to speak up, would you help them find the freedom today by bringing healing to their lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.